Uh, ladies and gentlemen, welcome uh, to uh, yet another uh, yet another webinar of the Prague Center for Middle East Relations. Today's topic is uh, the current state of ISIS in Syria and Iraq, struggling, prevailing, or thriving. On purpose, I uh, I didn't uh, I didn't put there uh, well diminishing because it doesn't seem like it. Today, uh, today with us we have uh, two uh, distinguished guests. Uh, each will be talking uh, about their country of expertise: uh, one for Iraq, one for uh, one for Syria. Uh, the first one is uh, Kameran Sadun, who is uh, independent journalist and fixer, uh, who is based in the Kurdistan region of Iraq, uh, and also quite frequently uh, frequently visits uh, visits uh, northern Syria. Uh, he is an award-winning Kurdish journalist and news fixer covering the news of Syrian and Iraqi Kurdistan since 2014. He actually covered all battles against ISIS uh, from uh, Hanakin in Iraq till Kobani in Syria. Uh, after ISIS was territorially defeated, he actually continued to extensively work in Syria uh, and Iraq. And in 2020, he won prestigious uh, Kurt Short News Fixer Award in International Journalism. Uh, in 2015-17, he worked with NPR covering both Kurdistan region and Rojava. Uh, he also worked as News Fixer and wrote for numerous agencies, uh, including Telegraph, Independent, Times, Washington Post, New York Times, LA Times, and uh, the ABC News. Uh, Paula Garcia is a researcher at the Center for Civilians in Conflict, or CIVIC, uh, based uh, in Erbil, in Kurdistan region of Iraq at the moment. Uh, Paula has conducted research on uh, threats to civilian protection in Kirkuk province caused by state and non-state actors, security and political fragmentation in Sinjar district and its effects on stabilization of the area, and on the impact uh, security actors and civil authorities are having on the return of internally displaced people to their areas of origin and the issue of perceived ISIS affiliated families. Prior to that, she worked at the American University of Kurdistan in Dohuk as a researcher and lecturer. Her research focused on dynamics between political and security actors and specifically obstacles for the return of the IDPs and the competing regional interests at stake in Sinjar and West uh, Nineveh. Both of speakers we have here, uh, we have here today uh, have extensive experience from the field. And unlike us, or most of us, who are actually locked down in their own countries, they still have up-to-date, fresh, uh, so to say, field experience of what's going on in, uh, in Syria and Iraq. Uh, this session's aim is to provide sort of an update on the current state of uh, the so-called Islamic State of Iraq and Syria, its activities, strategies for two countries, Iraq and Syria. ISIS capabilities at the moment, their modus operandi, prevailing safe havens, spaces of operations, as well as impacts of ISIS activities on civilians. Moreover, we want to discuss the successes and pitfalls of local authorities, both you know, administratively and politically, responding to ISIS. Maybe the Syrian Democratic Forces-led administration in northeast Syria, uh, the Syrian regime, or the federal and uh, Kurdistan regional governments in Iraq. Uh, now, Kameran Paula, thank you very much for joining us. Uh, it's a pleasure. Uh, Thanks, Thomas. You're very welcome. Now, uh, I'm Tomasz Kavalek. Uh, I will be moderating today's event. I am a director of the Prague Center for Middle East uh, Relations that is bringing you this uh, webinar. Now, uh, I would say not because ladies always go first, uh, but because it somewhat all started in Iraq, or most of it, I would say. Uh, I think I'm going to give floor to uh, Paula to deliver her uh, opening statement. Thank you, Paula. 
Thank you. Um, thank you for such a nice um, introduction of us. Um, Anna, for inviting me to participate in this webinar. It's my pleasure. Um, and uh, yeah, as, as Thomas said, like everything in a way started in Iraq, as like uh, ICC is in many ways a, an Iraqi product. Um, um, well, my name is Paula Garcia, as, as Thomas said, I work in, a, in an NGO, it's called the Center for Civilians in Conflict, where I conduct research. Um, and our work focuses on civilian protection and how to improve civilian protection and minimize civilian harm in conflict areas. Uh, we work in different um, conflict affected countries and in Iraq we do different activities from training with security forces on how to minimize civilian harms during military operations, um, community-based protection, advocacy, and also research to kind of like build upon um, our, our um, work in Iraq, our advocacy and our research. And uh, luckily, the, our re, uh, the research I've worked uh, for the past year has brought me very close to, to look at, at uh, conflict dynamics in the country and like the evolution of, of the ISIS threat in the country and also how that impacts civilians. Um, and also the, how the action and, inac and inaction of the security forces also uh, affect civilian protection. Um, so without more delay, uh, I will start a brief introduction about ISIS um, after the defeat of ISIS in 2017, um, just to track an evolution of, of the threat right now. Um, so uh, after the... Uh, after the defeat of ISIS in 2017, we saw like a security analysts uh, agree on a, on a reduction of the number of attacks in the country. Um, they were uh, clearly uh, remaining in ISIS cells in, uh, who have always uh, been suspected of hiding in the Yesira Desert in Inua, al Baj, Hathra, uh, Northern Anbar, and then other traditional areas of, of um, ISIS operations before um, the caliphate was declared, such as the Hamri Mountains in um, south west Kirkuk um, and like north uh, east of Salahadin, sorry, um, some areas of Diala. And, um, and uh, in fact, during the liberation of Hawiya, who was the last, um, the last ISIS stronghold to be liberated after Mosul, uh, the liberation of Hawiya was very um, it went very smooth and there were no major military operations. There was no major resistance from ISIS. And it's suspected that uh, most of the fighters, in fact, ran towards the mountains, right? Towards the Habri Mountains and Mahul and so on. Um, so there has been a, a presence of ISIS cells there. Now, these areas are very inaccessible uh, from the government historically and by the security forces. It is like all these mountainous areas. And also in Salahadin and Kirkuk, there are a lot of canals um, and like uh, rivers, canals with a lot of reeds and a lot of uh, good, let's say, hiding spots. Um, at the same time, the group uh, is known to, to keep to half at that moment and to still have uh, numerous weapon uh, depots across the country, uh, especially across these areas where they have stored some of those weapons and as well as money and like explosive and so on. Um, so but anyway, in, at the end of 2017 and 2018, the, it, was, it was very obvious that the, the operational capabilities of the group have severely diminished. Um, there were no larger complex attacks to be recorded or like not many. And it was mainly, their operations were mainly based on like hit and run, uh, low cost and um, uh, operations are also like sort of like cost effective operations for them where the risk um to lose members was uh quite low um a lot of these attacks were also opportunistic uh, in the sense of uh some well there was a as always like a broad use of of either um impro imp improvised explosive device sorry ids um and uh but for example uh it's remarkable not remarkable but for a group like isis there was a lack of suicide bombings and one of the explanations for that is like the group could not afford at that moment um to lose operatives um that period of 2017 2018 um uh, isis was sort of like regrouping reorganizing these capabilities and uh, there were attacks but it was like more concentrated in these areas um, however, we have seen 
an improvement of the capabilities and their operations in 2019, in particularly second half of 2019, and then 2020 until now. Um, so the range of mobility of the group in the country has increased, as like now they are operating in broader areas of the country, uh, still mainly concentrated in Salahadin, Diala, uh, some parts of Niniwa, um, uh, and, and some parts of Ambar, which is mainly the desert, right? Um, uh, sorry, I lost the plot. <laughs> oh yeah, so their attacks have focused on, on targeting the security forces, uh, mainly, and those uh, pro-government actors, so to speak. Um, uh, that's like tribal leaders, like government employees, like government officials and uh, tribal leaders that are known to be pro-governmental, muhtars, which are community leaders in the villages, or, or a muhtar will be like a community leader in a neighborhood or a, or a village. Um, and uh, well, through uh, something that I want to bring from my own experience is that like through our research that we were conducting in 2019 in Kirkuk, uh, we were looking at the threats to civilian protection coming from ISIS, uh, from the existence of ISIS cells, and then how the security forces were dealing with that, right? And this can also be extrapolated to like other areas like Diala. Um, and what I saw, uh, what we see is that um, like large rural areas of Kirkuk, such so like southern Kirkuk, like Hawija uh, district or Dakuk district, uh, and then at the same time, all the areas in, in Sarhadin um, um, have like a very minimal presence of the security forces. Um, there was a lot of cases of, of, of ISIS, uh, there were cases, like constant cases of uh, ISIS attacks, uh, mainly in the form of like IDs planted on the roads, uh, but also small and fire attacks towards villages. And, uh, and like, as I said before, like a bit is still like opportunistic, right? But you, we could see the first like complex attacks when ISIS would um, attack like a power station or uh, there were a lot of cases of arson where they would set up um, a fields, farming fields on fire. And then when the security forces or the emergency response teams will come, then they will, they will be hit by an ID or they will be attacked by, by an ISIS cell, right? And as a result of that, we saw that the security forces were less responsive because they knew that a lot of these attacks were staged to, to attract their attention, right? And like, um, and, um, and the, the problem of this, the consequence of this is that a lot of like rural areas in, in, in Southern Kirkuk were like largely unprotected. Um, and that was decreasing the number of, of IDPs, internally displaced people returning to the area. It was like slowing the economic uh, stabilization of recovery of the area and the stabilization and so on. And like I, I did a lot of interviews with, um, with civilians, both like Kurds, Arabs in Dakuk and, and, uh, and Hawija, and a lot of them were feeling really defenseless and, and sort of like abandoned by the security forces, and a lot of them have in their own village to establish their own, their own defense mechanisms, right? We will be like a couple of, of men of the village on the rooftops with, with weapons. Um, now, the, the problem with this is like it perpetuates the, the or it creates and perpetuates this, uh, this feeling among many Iraqis living in rural areas that the state is not protecting them and the security forces is not protecting them. And, uh, and, and, and then it hinders the, the image of the government, right? Um, but also the response of the security forces and what can be expected from them. Um, uh, at the same time, it is leaving some areas of the country empty, right? And this is, this is problematic because then this is kind of like allowing ISIS to expand to those areas, right? And we saw that in some parts of Dakuk where like the residents were thinking in living or in some villages, they effectively left the area. Um, uh, and then they were living in pockets, right? Um, the same happened in Diala in other areas of Diala, where um, Diala is a, is a complicated uh, context as well, because of the existence of somehow sectarian tensions and also the presence of a lot of uh, uh, different security actors from Iraqi security forces, but also popular mobilization units or the Hassan Shabi, no? Um, and then uh, because of the 
grievances between some of these components, um, we could see some, some villages and some groups of civilians that will be in target uh, by ISIS. Uh, I remember a case in Abu Saida district where like a, a group of the returnees that had just come back, they were being attacked by ISIS because they were considered to be ISIS, uh, government supporters, but they were being attacked at the same time and harassed by some security actors because they were seen as ISIS supporters. As a result, the, the citizens end up leaving the village because they, they because of this pressure and then the village like the area becomes empty and as a result it becomes an ISIS stronghold. Um, so, so this is one of the risks of like this lack of, of, um, of, of security force response. Now, one of the problems um, that we have found in, in while well, conducting research on civilian protection in Iraq is that a lot of, the, a lot of these attacks or a lot of this ISIS activity concentrate uh, on the disputed territories, the areas that are disputed between, between the KRI and Baghdad and the Iraqi government, and also in particular um, in like the stretch of land that will be between those borders, right? Like in, for example, in Mahmur and Kirkuk, uh, that like stretch of land that, that a lot of people would refer as like no man's land, um, where there is no under control of the Kurdish government and the Kurdish security forces, no under the control exactly of the Iraqi security forces. And then there is a lot of mobility there. Um, and then another issue um, uh, that is, uh, that is um, like hindering the response of the security forces and, uh, and, and severely hindering the, the collection of intelligence is the, is the security forces in Iraq traditionally and historically um, have a lack of coordination and intelligence sharing. Um, for those who have worked in Iraq, you know, there are many different, uh, different Iraqi security forces and now other security actors such as the PMU, and each of them have their own databases of, of um, ISIS suspects or, or um, their own intelligent units. And all of these intelligent units, um, so we have the Istihbarat with the local police, but then also other types of like military intelligence, and, uh, and then the, um, uh, the National Security Service, all of these um, sort of like intelligence agencies, they don't necessarily share information and coordinate in an adequate way to be able to respond to the threats. Um, and that is, uh, that is perhaps one of the, the, the challenges that the new Iraqi government needs to, needs to tackle. Um, um, apart from like deploying um, maybe more security forces in some areas that are known to have more activity. Now, recently, I think I'm talking too much, sorry. Uh, Final. Uh, recently, we have seen um, a, a spike of attacks uh, in the Ala Kirkuk and Salahadin, and uh, more recently this month, uh, really, uh, well, the brutal attack in Baghdad on the 21, uh, which I think the death toll was something like 38 people, and it was a suicide attack, which then again brings to the question if ISIS is going to start conducting um, suicide attacks again in the country. Um, and it was also, uh, if you follow uh, what happened, it was a double suicide attack where like somebody, uh, an IV, a suicide bomber, follow an IV detonation to target the respondents. No? Uh, but even before that, there was another attack on the 18 in Jalaula in a power station where ISIS members arrived to the power station and detained all the personnel and then blew up the power tower. Now attacks on power stations are very, have been very common in the Al and Salah Hadin, uh, but this is particularly remarkable because of the fact that they detain people. Uh, and more recently, I think on the 23, um, there was also a, a complex coordinated attack in Daura a province, uh, sorry, district in Salahadin, where 11 PMUs were killed. Um, and all these attacks seem to seem on one side to indicate that there might be uh, um, an, an, well, there is an increase in activity, but like um, that they are increasing their capabilities. Uh, but we must also think if, if, if the group and what is left of the group maybe is using this to like portray their strength. Uh, much more than the strength that they actually have. Um, because let's not fool ourselves. I mean, what happened in 2014 is an historical anomaly and is unlikely and we hope it will never repeat again. Um, um, however, 
uh, it is true that ISIS is coming back to this like insurgency logic of attacking rural areas and like pushing the security force away from the rural areas. So they take control of the rural areas and then kind of like the government and the security forces remain in urban center, which is what the situation in 2013 and 2014. Um, and finally, because this is the issue of a uh, mother of my last um, a research the, a report that is coming up um, soon on uh, the issue of, of the return of IDPs and the perceived affiliated families. Um, so the returns of, of, of the internally displaced people in Iraq uh, hasn't gone as smoothly as it should have. And there are uh, what, what we know when it's a block of returns. Um, and a lot of them is like the communities that reject the return of the families of alleged ISIS members uh, because of a sense of collective punishment. Um, now, this is leaving a lot of families uh, very vulnerable, uh, marginalized, a lot of like female headed households that the, the husband died and, uh, and they are completely stigmatized and, um, and they have been left aside, like the government is not providing a, an adequate response for these families. Now, the risk this is a great risk. Um, the way we see the civic is, a, apart from a human tragedy, it's a, it's a great risk for the civilization of, of the country uh, because it's leaving thousands of families um, marginalized, stigmatized. There are thousands of Iraqi children that don't have civil documentation and are not receiving an education and no support, and they are being const constantly stigmatized. So what is going to happen with these children when they grow up, right? And uh, and, and as well, the, the lack of integration of some people and the marginalization of some of these people and the lack of a sort of like a reconciliation strategy and a, and a national effort um, uh, to not only reconcile, but like write the, the history of, of what happened in 2014 and why it happened, uh, is, it is uh, it's not contributing to healing the wounds, wounds of the country and, and it's definitely uh, can renew the cycles of violence and in the future um, attract uh, people to these extremist groups. Thank you. Thank you very much, Paula. I already have uh, four additional questions, but let's leave it to the Q&A. Uh, thank you very much for your contribution. Uh, it was great, great detail, uh, wonderfully descri described uh, MO that we are seeing, and I have to say, Absolutely agree with the perception that 2019-20, uh, we see uh, ISIS getting more sophisticated. Uh, okay, thank you very much. And uh, now, Kamaran, uh, the floor is yours. Thank you. Uh, Paula, can you mute yourself, please? Uh, thanks, Thomas. Uh, so I will I will start a little bit to introduce, uh, like I will start with an introduction a little bit about ISIS in Syria. So they started in 2013 uh, in Raqqa, April 2013 in Raqqa, then uh, after that May uh, 2013 in, uh, in Deir ez So like the, they, they started extending uh, step by step from one, uh, from one area to another. So they went to uh, North till to Abyad and uh, Kobane in 2015. Uh, and also to Manbij uh, uh, till they get a uh, Turkish border uh, northwest of Syria. And in 2015, uh, they went to Palmyra. So they controlled the whole area, except some places inside uh, Deir Azor, they couldn't control it. So the airport, the airbase, and, and some areas through uh, the regime area. Uh, it was very, very small area. But we, we can say in 2015, uh, ISIS when controlling uh, uh, more than 50% uh, 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 maybe from, from, from Syria. Then uh, 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 the, the, the regression uh, stage started uh, from, uh, from SDF and from, uh, from, from the, the coalition uh, alliance, uh, uh, and especially the Kurds. So uh, Kobane 2015, uh, and until Abyad, so they started uh, 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 fighting ISIS, and then uh, 16 uh, in Manbij, uh, uh, and and the beginning of uh, or half of 16 in in uh, uh, Tabqa, Mansoura, 17 in in Raqqa, 
uh, until 18 uh, Derazor, then uh, uh, October uh, 19, uh, of, uh, sorry, October 18 till uh, Mar uh, March uh, 19 in the last pocket of ISIS in Hajin uh, uh, Baghuz area. Uh, so we, we can say that uh, ISIS uh, 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 stayed in the area more than between five and seven years. So um, they, they were controlling everything, every uh, single details in, in the area. So the culture uh, affected people, uh, 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 everyone. Uh, after uh, after March 2017, or at the end of ISIS in the whole area, because uh, uh, in Iraq they were before that. Uh, so the last pocket of ISIS was uh, was in Baghuz in uh, March uh, 23rd. Uh, so this is one stage, and the, the stage after that. So the stage that uh, the uh, ISIS uh, they were fighting, and then after that. Uh, uh, they, they uh, moved to another uh, strategic, which is uh, sleeper cells. So uh, uh, I, I will talk about this one because uh, in Syria, it's not like, it, maybe it's similar to Iraq, but it's a little bit different. In, in Iraq, there is some um, forces coordinating between each other. They are fighting out, like uh, uh, together. Peshmerga uh, with KRG and, and uh, Iraqi forces, uh, they are coordinating between each other. They are fighting in some places together, like, uh, like Kirkuk, like uh, uh, Tos Hormato area, Hamrin Mountains. They are fighting together uh, to, uh, against ISIS. But in Syria, it's totally different. So there is two forces, they are fighting ISIS in, um, uh, um, in Syria. Uh, there is Russian, uh, uh, the, the regime, and the Iranian militia, and there is SDF uh, with the coalition. So, uh, and each of them uh, uh, fighting in different areas. So there is uh, east of uh, Al Furat and west of Al Furat, um, Euphrates. So this, this is the, the place they are. Each one they are fighting in. Uh, and uh, uh, when we are talking about um, the, the Syrian regime area, so uh, Deir Zor, Abu Kamal, Maadin. Uh, Palmyra and the whole desert. So there is more, ISIS are more active in, in this area than the SDF area. So uh, uh, the desert, it's, it's more desert, uh, what they call Al-Badia. So if you go from, from, uh, uh, from Deir uh, to the uh, Taos, you will, you will see nothing. It's only desert till you get to Tanaf and Palmyra, this area. And uh, Sakhna, so the whole area, it's a desert. Uh, uh, many, uh, many, uh, many Syrian uh, forces killed in this area. The ISIS were uh, targeting them, and then they were dis uh, disappearing in the whole. Like, it's big. It's big desert. Um, in uh, uh, in 2000, since 2000, uh, March 2019 till now. Uh, uh, 1,221 uh, soldiers killed from the regime. Uh, 145 uh, they were from the uh, Iranian militia and two Russian. So it's a big number uh, since 2000, uh, 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 so 2019, beginning of, or March 2019. This is according to uh, uh, Observatory of uh, CN Observatory for Human Rights. Uh, uh, and recently, uh, in 2001, around uh, seven, 27 people killed also. In November, uh, ISIS targets a, a group of drivers of oil trucks um, uh, belonging to a Katerji company or Katerji group. So they are active and they are doing a lot of uh, attacks in this area. Uh, if you are comparing between the uh, Syrian side and go to the SDF uh, or uh, Northeast Syria, so uh, there, is, there is a big difference between 2019 and 2020. So it's, uh, in 2020, it's less than 2000, uh, uh, in, in 2019. So I have uh, uh, like, uh, some uh, uh, 
that about that. So in 2019, for example, uh, attack that's happened uh, in this area to 906 attacks in 2019. In 2020, 572. In uh, these cases, uh, 415 in 2019, to, uh, 299 in 2020. Uh, uh, arrests, the, the people that the, the forces arrest them from ISIS, 581 in 2019 and 575 in uh, 2020. Uh, and uh, ISIS crimes attacked uh, in 2019, 683. Uh, in 2020, 287. Uh, so we, we can see from this data that uh, in, 2000, uh, um, in 2019, they were more active than 2020 uh, because they arrest a lot of people. Uh, SDF and coalition, they are doing raids, uh, uh, and they did uh, they did 395 raids in in um, 2019. In 2020, uh, 221. So it's 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 big it's big difference between uh, 2019 and 2020. Uh, so uh, and and why this? Uh, because um, uh, they they captured a lot of uh, alliance and now they cannot uh, um, uh, uh, like ISIS they cannot uh, appearance more in or well, they cannot be active more in in this area. Uh, there is more acceptance in the other area because in in, in the regime area, uh, Iranian militia. Uh, uh, as we know that uh, the um, the community in in Deir Azur more they are. Uh, uh, Sunni, but the, the Iranian militia, they are Shia, so that's why um, they are more active, they, they don't accept them, uh, they are uh, uh, standing against them. In, in northeast Syria, or the, in the east side of SDF area, it's something different. It's more uh, Kurdish-Arab uh, 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 tension. It's not like the other side, it's more Sunni Shia uh, uh, tension. So uh, that's why, uh, and also there is, uh, I will not say that there is no sleeper cells in the area. Uh, no, there is maybe more than uh, the, the, the other side, uh, but they are not so active. There is a lot of forces there. So uh, with, from SDF and from American, from coalition. Uh, recently, uh, they are more active than before like end of 2020 and beginning of 2021, after, especially after what's happened in, um, in uh, Ain Isa, the attacks of the Turks uh, to Ain Isa, uh, SDF were just uh, fighting them. And now there's a lot of rumors that, uh, that Turkey will attack again the area. There is some tension between uh, uh, the regime and uh, self-administration, SDF in, uh, in Kamishli, al Hasaka. So all these problems helping sleeper cells to, to do some attacks. And recently, a week ago, uh, they did um, an attack in the Shisha. It's uh, uh, a thousand uh, of, um, of uh, Shaddadi. <clears throat> they killed two uh, women from um, civil council of the Shisha. Uh, and uh, and they did also so they killed some um, uh, one of the uh, uh, worker of one of the NGOs, uh, and also they did uh, one attack in in in, uh, in Baghdad. So all these are messages to their alliance that we are still alive. So I think it's more it's, it's more messages that we are still alive. I will not say that they are like before uh, when they were fighting. Uh, no, but it's more messages. Uh, there is also uh, uh, another problem that is it's it's one of the big problem in 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 North Syria, Al Hol camp. So in Al Hol, there is uh, now there is around sixty thousand, maybe between fifty five fifty seven thousand till sixty thousand um, individuals in Al Hol camp. Um, uh, in 
at the end of, of 2000 uh, or at the end of uh, Bahus, they were uh, 75, but now there's some people left, uh, Syrian people, uh, they returned to their areas uh, in, um, in Asusa, uh, Hajin, uh, Bahus, but now there's still a big number of uh, uh, ISIS supporters in one place. This is really, really uh, dangerous. And uh, I don't know, sometimes people don't, don't uh, um, care about that. But if you go to the area, if you go to, some, to be close to this area, you will see uh, uh, the effect of the, those people like, like in, in the area. There's a lot of, they are paying money. I don't know how they get money. Uh, there is still the Hawala still, still working getting money from outside, uh, there is, every day there is an, an attack. Uh, two weeks ago, uh, they discovered more than uh, seven cases, seven uh, people, uh, they were just killing uh, some, I think, because they are women, women killed, uh, they killed them and uh, uh, buried them also. <clears throat> uh, they found a lot of um, uh, cell phones, they found a lot of weapons inside, uh, inside uh, the camp. So sometimes they say, oh, they are women, but those, most of them, they are trained women and uh, they, 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 they have also their kids with them. They are 11, between 11 and 15 years old. So uh, they, they, most of them, they are couple of caliphates. They were just trained and they, some of them particip participated in some fighting. Uh, there is also one, one, one uh, issue, I don't know if, uh, Maybe even uh, till now, the, the, no, the like even the journalism, the, no one from the journalists talk about that. There is some cases um, they discover some uh, pregnant woman inside the camp. This is this is very very important. So this woman, they are like they are married from those 13, 15, 14 years kids to get uh, to be pregnant, and they they, they because they want to. They are saying that oh we we like you 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 put our men in the prison but we have some also men here so we are stay like we are staying here and we are uh, what they call it uh, growing or become better, like more and more this is this is uh, one of the like problem that now the self administration uh, facing uh, big number they cannot control it they. Uh, there is no NGOs there, uh, UN uh, don't help, uh, and after 2000, uh, October 2019, a lot of NGOs left the area. So all these problems coming to, uh, uh, they are coming to, like, the, uh, it's a load of problems, uh, and uh, self-administration cannot do it. Um, and uh, I, I can say that the, the, the ISIS will not return as, as before, uh, because uh, uh, there's many reasons uh, that the, the, regi the ISIS will not return like before. Uh, first of all, um, they don't have enough uh, funding from outside. Uh, before, uh, they were selling oil to Turkey and even to regime, to the Kurds, to the Iraqi government. They had a lot of money uh, and uh, they were just um, buying uh, weapons. Uh, also, uh, the border between Turkey and uh, North uh, North East Syria was open, so a lot of uh, jihadists came from out um, everywhere. So now I think no one will come and join. Uh, and also, uh, uh, most of the leaders now they are in uh, prison in North East Syria with the Kurds. So more than five thousand uh, prisoners in the prisons in, in uh, Hasaka, Shaddad area. Uh, 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 and also I, I heard like in one of my interviews in, uh, in one of the prisons, they said, one of the uh, prisoners said, we did a mistake that we, uh, the ISIS uh, show all these, uh, their leaders to, the, to be public. So, uh, and uh, everyone came and they, they target their those leaders like the Americans or the French or, or, or <clears throat> the other other um, uh, what they call it nationalities uh, I, I can say that the Kurd, one of the uh, the reason that maybe uh, ISIS will stay 
uh, in, in the area uh, because there is no coordination between the two uh, groups that they are fighting ISIS, uh, Russian, Iranian uh, regime from one side and uh, the coalition and the Kurds from another side. This is one of the big problem maybe uh, maybe they, they will facing. Uh, so that's maybe will keep uh, ISIS aligned. And, and also, if there is no uh, support to the area, uh, because, because this, the, the, the ideology, you cannot just tell them, okay, guys, uh, ISIS is gone, and now everything will return uh, like before. No, it's not like this. So the, the whole area needs support. They, they need the, uh, uh, because since 2011, after 2011, the majority of people uh, left schools. So the kids who was 10, now he became 20. So now he's a man, he's not educated. Anyone can just uh, just uh, take him and uh, put him in his side with a little bit of money or weapons or something like this. So uh, I can, this is what I have. And uh, yeah, it's just like open to you guys. Thanks. Thank you very much, uh, Cameron, for your uh, elaborate uh, opening remarks. Um, and uh, before we go to Q and A, uh, I would like to ask you uh, guys who are participating in the discussion, either uh, write me your questions into chat or raise your hands, and we are going to give you a uh, floor to ask your uh, ask your questions. Uh, and now, as I noted several questions, uh, I will reserve my right or privilege, let's say, as a moderator to ask uh, one question each. So uh, for Paula, uh, my question is, because you mentioned that there's the no man's land, those gaps between uh, positions of Iraqi security forces and, uh, and uh, Kurdish forces. Uh, I know we've been hearing for quite a few years that they are working on extended coordination to improve the situation, to deny this important safe haven for ISIS. So my question is, how is the coordination going these days? What's the, what's the status? Uh, were there any positive steps forward or is it just a lot of talk as usual about joint coordination cells, but nothing really happening? Uh, and my question, uh, my question for uh, Cameron is uh, whether uh, in Syria you have you still have foreign fighters, uh, including Iraqis, as ISIS operatives, or whether it is mainly locals who are cooperating with each other. And we're actually a uh, sub question to that: Do we see some kind of hints of coordination? Uh, of uh, ISIS cells and ISIS operations across those two areas, meaning north of Euphrates and west of Euphrates? Do they somehow coordinate uh, with each other their operations? Uh, thank you. So the floor is yours to answer your questions. Shall I go first? Um, um, thank you. Um, well, actually, um, I haven't seen anything like remarkable or positive in regarding these like joint coordination centers, but maybe Camila knows more than I do actually about this. I don't know. Um, uh, but the last thing, I mean, the, the, having all this talk about these coordination centers, uh, UNAMI, as far as I know, the UN has been um, sponsoring or trying to facilitate these, these talks, not only dispute, um, the resolution of, of, of um, issues in the disputed territories, but also in terms of security. Um, but yet having talks, uh, and then I, I know that like more recently, they had agreed uh, to open some such centers and they have actually discussed the locations. And one of them, for example, I think was gonna be in Kalahanjir. Um, but then as far as I understand, uh, but again, maybe Camila knows more about this, but I, I don't know. Uh, the, the talks were stalled again because, because of, not only because of this agreement between the KRG and the government of Iraq, but because of this agreement within the KRG, between, within the two parties, because they don't seem to agree um, 
who security forces, as, as you know, the KRG security forces are not unified as one security forces. They are uh, belong to the two main parties. There is a small unified force, but the great, the bigger ones belong to the to the two, both in Peshmerga and in Asais, to the two main parties. And I think there was some dispute about like the deployment of some of these forces, uh, who will be in its center. Uh, that's one. And then also the the Hasha, the PMUs are quite opposed to the deployment of the KRG security forces in some of the disputed territories where they are present, such as the ALA and, and KRG. So, I mean, there is this back and forth, but they, I don't see anything moving forward substantially, I guess. Thank you. Thank you, Paula. Cameron? Uh, okay, so uh, uh, according to the information that's, uh, uh, that we, we get from the SDF and um, um, and even the, the coalition, there is no uh, uh, big fishes from the big leaders, uh, foreigners, uh, since 2000, uh, maybe I will say half 2019 till, till now. There is some Iraqis and uh, uh, the, not a lot of Iraqis. So most of them, the leaders, they are Iraqis in the area. They, they catch all of them. Um, for the relation between the sites, I think, uh, Yes, of course they have a coalition, uh, but that, as an information, I don't, I don't have information. But of course, there is some coordination between the two parts, ISIS in the two parts. Hey, thank you very much. Uh, now we have a we have a first question in uh, in chat uh, from Imad. Uh, thank you, Paula. I'm not sure if you know and or have read Marta Refkin's work. Yeah, Imad, I read it actually just this morning. We have conducted profound research and thick data on many topics you have mentioned. Uh, oh, it's not a question. Okay, <laughs> so let's turn uh, let's turn to audience. It's just a comment, Paula. Please please uh, read it uh, read it through. Uh, and now let me see if I see any raised hands. Or you can just type your question into chat if, if you wish. Yes. Hello, everybody. Uh, my name is Philip, and I'm studying regional and political geography. And uh, first of all, I would like to thank Sarah for organizing this debate on the, this, this webinar and for uh, both Cameron and Paula for their uh, uh, excellent yes, as always. Um, and my question is uh, that two days ago, uh, there was uh, news on Rudeau that ISIS is regrouping and gaining strength in uh, Iraqi disputed territories. So um, my question is uh, for both of you is what do you think that uh, about that, that ISIS is regrouping its fighters from Syria and Iraq to do something bigger in Iraqi disputed territories. If there, if there is a trend in this, and if there is a possibility. So thank you both. So thanks, Philip. Uh, may <clears throat> Maybe I can ask, uh, answer your questions uh, re regarding Syria. Of course, there is regrouping of, of ISIS. Um, and as, as we said in the beginning, that um, uh, they stayed in the area more than uh, between five, seven years in, in the, the whole area, like Deir Azor, uh, Raqqa, like it's big area. And, uh, and they, they, they had some acceptance also. Uh, like some people say, oh, no, they just came and they control it because they have the uh, uh, the power now, uh, they, they, they had also some acceptance in, in the uh, local community. And uh, because now if you just go there and, and asking them, uh, if you tell now, if you are just asking them to compare between uh, the time under uh, Islamic State and uh, the regime, they will say, oh, no, we didn't have any problem with the Islamic State, except they didn't allow us to, to smoke or maybe some woman, they will say, okay, they were just uh, forcing us to, to wearing khimar and this kind of thing. It's not, it's a, like small things, but they, they were like, uh, they were liking ISIS. And till now, uh, uh, 
people like uh, uh, the majority of people in, in the area, they are supporting ISIS. So if they will see any, uh, any, any support that's coming to the area, so they will join directly, except uh, the uh, international community to find some ways that's to, to keep them away. And I, I said it's ideology, uh, more than five, seven years. Uh, just to put it in, in the mind, and you cannot just take it out in 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 uh, two years. And now they put, and and especially they put them all in uh, in the camp, in one of the maybe worst camp in uh, in the world, like Al Hol camp. Seventy thousand, seventy five thousand people in one place. There is no there is no help. There is no uh, support. And after that, uh, what when when Turkey came and uh, occupied the area after October. 2019, uh, most of the NGOs left, so it was only uh, self-administration, and uh, you know, it was lack of services. Uh, uh, a lot of people died in in the hospitals, and I did a story with Washington Post about uh, uh, what they call uh, red uh, Kurdish Red Crescent. They were only uh, 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 NGO. They are work. They were working in in the camp. Just imagine 70,000 people in one cap, it's more than, it's big, big, big city. So I don't think that, uh, that ISIS will just go uh, very easily. And uh, the report will be, I think that it's, it's true, uh, like regrouping uh, in the area. Uh, Paula, do you want to, uh, do you want to add something? No, I, I mean, I agree with Camila, and it's, it's kind of like in line with what I said. Um, I, I think like, after 2017, there was this like the calm kind of like before the storm, where like everything was very quiet because they were reorganizing and 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 um, and they had lost a lot of members and a lot of not equipment because but like they, they were in this like more maybe planning and slowing down phase and now we can see how they are like reorganizing and launching more attacks. And now how strong they are, I think we. We and I'm not. I'm not probably the best um, qualified person to say this, but like I, I'm not. I'm not sure we should give them that much credit because a lot of these attacks that they are staging now, there might like ISIS has a propagandistic. It's. I mean, if there is something that ISIS is famous for, it's like their propaganda, the media, and all of that. So um, I, just, I just think we should always be very critical about about these new attacks and if they really represent a strength or they are just very well staged. We have a question on, uh, on our chat. Uh, let me scroll a bit up. Uh, it's actually a question for, uh, for Paula, but perhaps, uh, perhaps Kamaran will also uh, have some knowledge about that. Uh, uh, Yindri Hudecek is asking, what's your opinion on, on Shingal agreement? Uh, is it successful so far? Are there any clashes recorded between uh, the groups that are at the moment present there? And uh, that's the million dollar question. Uh, if it's going to get implemented, can it actually be some kind of imprint or can it be applicable for other disputed areas? Uh, thank you. That's, that's it so far. Yeah. Do you want to go first, Kamiran? Yeah, it's a little bit complicated, Sinjar. Uh, it's it's not only uh, political. It's uh, I don't know. It, Shingal is very complicated now, especially all these forces now. They are controlling the area. There is PKK inside. There is uh, uh, the allies of PKK, uh, Shingal forces. There is the Hajj Shabi. There is the the. The Peshmerga, they have like their support and also Peshmerga, their Iraqi government and all of them. Um, and people get tired, to be honest. Uh, uh, like, I think it was like end of 2020, some people, they were just calling me because I, I've been there many times. They were just calling me. They say, oh, we, we need like a solution for our our situation. Because if you are just going with... Uh, uh, like when we say, okay, we need Peshmerga, so we have some other, like PKK, they say, oh, you are just supporting them and they are not allowing us to work. Or if we say, okay, we will just go to support Peshmerga, 
then the other the PKK is then we have like problems in the other side. So it's more it's more uh, it's more political things. And now it's affected also in the, the Yazidis when um, when they elected the the Yazidi uh, the Baba Sheikh. So uh, so now they become two parts. Uh, 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 Yazidis in Shingal and Yazidis in Karji. Uh, yeah, it's really cool. uh, don't I don't know exactly how they will solve it uh, because now the problem between Yazidis themselves. It's not it's not uh, the KRG or Hajj Shabi or PKK. It's more uh, Yazidis themselves. So I don't know, Paula. Do what would you think? No, I, I agree in a lot of that, and I find that for, for not only for Yazidis in general, for Shingalis, uh, for non Yazidis, uh, Muslim and Shia Kurds and Arabs in, in, from Xinjiang and Al-Baj, it's, it's an extremely frustrating situation for them because they, um, they see their area being subjected to, to a lot of these like regional and national interests and all this like power play. Uh, so at the end of the day, like, doesn't really matter what they want or it doesn't really matter um uh, like you know improving their lives or, or and and i think like yeah so i agree with you there are different layers here because there is an intra not yesidi conflict but there is like a fragmentation uh within the yesidi community as in other minorities uh that is also caused by, by the, how the how political parties in the national level and in the KRG and in, in Baghdad have have uh, tried to co-opt these minorities on their side and then kind of like causing or uh, deepening a fragmentation within them. Um, uh, so so that is a problem on one side. And then there is like all these like like regional interests that are on Sinjar and 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 also between the KRG and Baghdad. Um, so it's a and I, I think like, so we published a report on Sinjar and one of the, one of the conclusions that we have is how kind of like Baghdad is being used as a bargaining chip by some of the, by some of the political actors in Iraq um, and uh, at the expense of the, the reconstruction of the area and the, and the Shingali people. Um, and because they, and like, I mean, it is in the report that we published of like how, um, how some of the actors that were in power before 2000, before 2014, before uh, before ISIS, um, have have uh, sort of like purposely boycott the establishment of services uh, if they were not coming along with those services. Uh, so right now in Sinja, I mean, there are two majors. There is a legal major, and then there is an actor major, and they are like how many security forces? I don't know, like at least uh, eight or nine or ten all with different alliances. I mean, it's not, um, it's very frustrating for, for the people there. And about this agreement, um, as if it should be like, serve as a model to other uh, parts of Iraq. I don't know, I hope not, <laughs> because it's a, it's a very like, it's very top down, uh, which does expect it. Uh, but it, it's also like, like really neglecting um like what people want uh and also because i mean reading in between the lines of the agreement you can see how um it is sort of um there is going to be a negotiation between between the two sides to 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 get their way and and like at the end of like the stabilization of Sinjar or or the reconstruction or or establishing poli elected political elected officials that actually represent the people. That's the less of the concerns of the agreement, and and that's not going to work because there is a lot of people. Like there is a strong push to push the the, the perceived PKK forces, uh, the EVC, which at the end of the day are formed by local Yazidis. So I mean, they, they they have the support of part of the population, not all, but part of the population, and they are being treated as a foreign actor. But that's not that's not completely true because they are formed by local population. There is this push to 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 push this force away, um, and uh, but there is no there is a lack of dialogue in the agreement, and uh, and, I, and I don't think that's that's going to work because it's not only the the 
the Yevishe, but other other security actors that are in the place, they are not they are not gonna be willing to leave. I do like um, I mean the idea of forming a a, a local security force uh, will be very positive. Uh, but I don't think I think it's naive to think that that's gonna happen with no political interference and and so on. And and that's that's the problem. Thank you very much, uh, Paula. Now we have a, another question from audience from uh, Ondra Filipets. Uh, it's a question for both of you. Uh, he's thanking you for very interesting insights. And he would last, like to ask about uh, ISIS ideology at the moment. Do you think the ideology is evolving somewhat uh, in the last uh, one or two years? Or is ideology now a secondary issue? And I would, and I would perhaps add, yeah, yeah, exactly. Is it evolving somewhat? Uh, are there any changes in their messaging? Uh, or do we see the same old, same old, what we were used to, except of, of course, propagating that they are actually governing some, uh, some areas and cities? Uh, I, I don't know exactly. I think it's the, the same ideology, uh, like uh, nothing like a big difference happens. Uh, it's the same one. But uh, the thing that we cannot see it because it's not public, that's why. But if you go to uh, if you go to the camps, you will see the ideology there. So that's why I'm just focusing on the camp because uh, if if we will say that those people will return back, so thirty thousand, more than thirty thousand people, they they were the Syrian, uh, twenty nine thousand, they were Iraqis, uh, twelve, thirteen thousand, they were foreigners. Uh, uh, it's it's big. Like those people, they were staying in, like in the camp. If you go. And, and if those people will return back, and of course they have a lot of alliance inside, uh, I think it, the, the ideology still, but not as before, like in the public. So no, no one can say, oh, this is, they can just, uh, uh, just, they, they just uh, uh, go in the street and say, Allah Akbar, and they will kill this one or, yeah. But if you go to, to the camp, uh, still uh, the same. I don't know, Paula, if she has any. I don't. Um, I'm not an, an expert on like jihadi ideology, so I I don't know to which extent it has evolved. Um, have no contributions on that side. I would say that um, like maybe the like the support from from the population might have changed in some areas, uh, but then as Camilani is saying, like. Um, and as I said before, like there is this risk that if if there is no national exercise in Iraq, like a national effort of like reconciliation and and only reconciliation, but like kind of like building like a national um, like a truth commission and a, a national discourse of 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 um, kind of like why this happened and 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 uh, and how can we how can you, we make peace so this doesn't happen? If there is not these efforts, and then you keep marginalization, marginalizing large sects of, of, the, of the society and like not allowing um, hundreds of Iraqi families to come back home and keeping them like isolated and in poor conditions, that, that's the ideology that they are gonna embrace in the future. Uh, but I don't know about the ideological change in this course that ISIS is having, that, I'm not sure. Thomas, you are muted. <laughs> uh, speaking from the insurgency and counterinsurgency insurgency literature point of view, the root cause, which is Sunni marginalization, especially, as you said, rural communities, uh, that is something that uh, started ISIS back in the day or even before predecessor organizations. Uh, and the root cause appears to still be there, not addressed systematically. Uh, so, uh, ladies and gentlemen, do we have uh, any other questions from the from the audience? You can raise your hand and or use uh, use chat. So, in that case, I have a few questions. <laughs> uh, 
uh, if there is uh, nobody from the audience wanting to comment or ask question. Um, what uh, I read from analysis, op-eds, newspaper articles, is that uh, ISIS is shifting back to its MO prior to 2012-11, focusing on being a lot like a cr criminal enterprise, essentially being organized crime group. So, of course, we are hearing reports here and there that kidnappings are widespread for ransom. Uh, we are hearing that people uh, get extorted, businessmen, families, you know, farmers, etc., cetera, etc. Cetera. Um, so that phenomenon is definitely there. And my, my question is for both of you, do you see this phenomenon on the rise? Uh, ISIS being able to essentially extort more people because if they can, that means they have more money, more funds. Yes, guys. Um. Okay, I go first this time. <laughs> um, I'm not. I'm not sure of their ability to store people as before. Um, I'm. I'm not sure, but I will be very surprised if they could um, store and like um, have the access to revenues and like sort of like tax collection that they were having in in 2013, 2014 before before they do power. Um, what I did see during the research that we we're doing in Kirkuk is that um, some, um, so like some ISIS fighters would like come down from the mountains during the night, sometimes because they have family members actually in the villages around, uh, but over times to to buy things from the population um, instead of like stealing them, and then other times to 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 uh, steal from them, but that was the minority. Most of the times they, they were coming and buying stuff. Uh, but then as far as I know, they did have some support, but more in the form of like family networks, uh, their family members would support. So I don't know to which extent um, they were starting or getting paid. Um, no, don't know, Camilan? Uh, I really don't know exactly this. this uh, I'm not sure about the information. But uh, as I said before in in, uh, uh, in my speech, that they don't have this uh, way that funding them. So because they were they, they have like oil, they were uh, controlling the whole area. Uh, like everything was under their control. They were just taking tax and everything. But now uh, they don't have all this. Maybe maybe uh, they have some uh, alliance. They are supporting them. Some some rich people. They are supporting them. But uh, not as much as before, uh, as I know. Uh, so the support will be from, like, I, I don't know, but it, it will not be like before. It's not like before that they will come and they will get money or some, some big sheikh or leaders, they will just give them money, trucks and weapons. Uh, I don't think, I don't think it's, it's like before. Thank you very much. Uh, ladies and gentlemen, another uh, time for questions from the audience. Nobody wants to ask. No matter. I have more questions. No yeah. problem. Um, now, you both actually mentioned the security fragmentation as a problem, that you have <clears throat> multiple security forces that are not coordinating with each other that well. Especially, Cameron, you mentioned in Syria, the problem is uh, that the SDF and the regime and the Russians and the Iranians are not coordinating at all. Uh, in Iraq, we very well know that the security structures are fragmented, so that's the uh, similar, uh, despite probably not as a grave case of uncoordination. So, uh, my question is because that has been the answer of the Syrian regime, for example. Uh, local tribal defense forces. Paula mentioned that people in the villages, in disputed areas, in the rural areas, are having their uh, their uh, own militias, let's say. Also, we are seeing uh, minority militias, Shabak militia, Shia Turkmen militia, Christian militias. 
So my question is, in your view, are lo is localization of security actually helping out? Could it be a, one of the solutions, one of the good counterinsurgency strategy, or is it just creating more mess because it's just another security force on the ground? Uh, so I think uh, Thomas, this is uh, this is very important. Uh, uh, the way that, uh, as I told you, there is no coordination between the both uh, sides, uh, and like especially I told you in in uh, in Mayadin and Bukhama, the area that the Iranian they are controlling. So uh, you are just hearing that oh, there is some uh, there is more uh, separating Shia ideology in this area, and for the Sunni, it's they don't like it. So maybe that's why they don't they like. Uh, they are they are not coordinating. Even there is no coordination between Syrian regime and uh, and uh, local community. Um, uh, in the on the other side, uh, uh, when SDF um, established a lot of Arabs now because it, when now when we are talking about uh, SDF, there is a, a military council from uh, from everywhere from Tabqa, from Raqqa, from Deir Ezzor. Uh, from Manbij, they are like Arabs and they are joining SDF. So uh, 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 I remember when we went to Bahus, I was there. So the majority, 90, maybe 90 percent of those, the, the, the soldiers, they were Arab. They were not Kurd. So uh, some leaders, of course, they were Kurd. Uh, yeah, they were getting logistically also from the Kurd, but the majority. So I was I was with them in, in inside, like in the front front lines, they were Arab. And the majority were from uh, Shariatat, for example. This also make, like as you said, uh, to make a lot of groups like Shia, uh, sorry, like Shabak supporter. Because in Iraq also they they have something else. It's it, it's a little bit uh, complicated, which is there is uh, 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 there is uh, Sunni Shabak, there is uh, 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 Shia Shabak. So. Uh, uh, I, I remember the, the time that uh, in, the, in the time of liberation, uh, Mosul, uh, the Shia Shabak they were just going there to just to uh, revenge, and now the same things in in Syria. Shariatat, I heard a lot of people they were so like Shariatat just coming and re revenging, and now they have uh, because they have weapons, they have everything, and you know the the, the revenge uh, in in our society it's something like. Uh, 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 it's a lot, so people are just like revenging in the area. So maybe this one to putting uh, weapons in the wrong hands, also making mess. Uh, so uh, it's making more mess uh, in, in the area than to 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 find a solution. Maybe Paula also. Would... Thank you, Kamala. Paula, do you have uh, do you have a comment you want to make? Um. um... Well, so in Iraq, since since the beginning, there has been um, so there is the the Hasha Hasha Shabi, uh, but there is also Hasha Ashari, which is like the tribal mobilization units, and then uh, and then you will have like also groups uh, formed by minorities. Now the I don't know. I guess it, it follows. Uh, no, it. Maybe perhaps it's like a bit similar. We want to follow a model uh, that was like the Sahwa councils in um, um, created by a sponsor and facilitated by the Americans. Uh, Paula, uh, Paula, could 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 you maybe remind because uh, um, perhaps some people don't remember Sahwa and some sorry, the salvation. Um, so during the when did this start? In 2007, 2000. It was 2006, seven, and the success was peaking seven, eight. Right. So during the 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 moment, um, one of these like height uh, um, of of the after American of the Iraqi uh, of the Iraqi of the, Iraqi, of the Iraq war or the civil war, if you want to call it that way, um, uh, the 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 U.S. decide to create this like to facilitate that fund these sort of like tribal militias in the areas that were known to have a strong um, Sunni insurgency. There was both. A bit, it, it started as a Baathist, pro-Baathist, anti-American insurgency, but then it was slowly co-opted and kind of like um, 
um, assimilated by a more like jihad insurgency. And in some areas of Ambar, for example, it was, it, it was uh, uh, when they had a lot of, of control and operability and like they, they were targeting uh, American forces all the time and, and like government Iraqi forces all the time and the Americans sponsored this, this like tribal mobilization, this like tribal units, right? Who were a great success because it was like giving the power to the tribes of the area um, to, to control the areas, like to secure the areas. Um, uh, and, and, and I don't remember the statistics, but they had like a massive success in like a, like a slowing, no a slowing down, like cutting uh, the number of, of attacks against coalition forces and against the Iraqi security forces, uh, like enormously. The failure, and then you can correct me if, if uh, you have more information on this, but the failure was that they were meant to be integrated in the Iraqi security forces. Uh, but the Iraqi government at that time, controlled by um, al-Maliki, was not, we didn't facilitate that. So they were slowly sidelined, and, and and then they never became like properly integrated in the security forces. So now, um, but something similar happened during liberation, right? Like some of the tribes wanted to take part of the liberation. They were creating these like tribal units, and then after liberation. They, some of these tribal units have been in, in, in control of the areas and, uh, and um, they know the area and, and they know the neighbors and, and also um, to a certain extent like there is, there is some civilians that will feel more safe because it's, it's, it's very it's the same tribe right so it's very familiar and you have that in, in Kirkuk actually in Hawija where, where there's like two um, Hasha Shari forces uh, actually in different areas um, I don't think that is uh, negative at this stage of the stabilization of the country uh, as like, yeah, I agree that it's like, again, having another security force in the ground. Um, hopefully in the future they will be reabsorbed, but maybe for the meantime, it's also a way to, to empower and um, to kind of like give security duties to, to to the citizens of the area. And given also, I'm going to say, how um, some of the security forces in Iraq are being perceived by the population as being very sectarian or, or not caring about them, um, it might work that in some areas uh, they feel more protective, but then they're also more responsive. Because I did find during the recent Kirkuk that people would more often call um, the tribal mobilization units because of family connections, because they will be calling their cousin, right? Uh, but also because they found them more, they found them more responsive as, as uh, because they were protecting their own, right? Uh, not that the other forces didn't respond always, but um, I, I, I don't know. Okay. Uh, and uh, now I have uh, a question that is concerned about the future. I know, I know we in social science, sciences, we, we cannot really predict 100%, but uh, if you would paint what we should expect in 2021, 22, uh, in terms of uh, ISIS capabilities, focus, provided that the policies of the governments both in Syria and the SDF and Iraqi security forces and Baghdad government are not going to significantly change. If the status quo remains, what should we expect of ISIS? How are they going to react to that? How are they going to, how are they going to develop? Um, it's really, uh, yeah, I, I said it's really good question. And then the problem is, uh, uh, the, I, I said also before that the ideology was uh, the ISIS were, they were staying in the area for five, six, six, seven years, and before them uh, they were uh, Syrian Free Army, then uh, uh, al Sham came, then Jabhat al Nusra, then so uh, after that the ISIS now uh, uh, the now the SDF and all of them so. Uh, if there is no support to the area, I think people will stay. Uh, they will stay like uh, uh, what, what they call it. Uh, 
they they will go with with anyone just giving them money or support or empathy or or any anything else so they will just uh, uh, go with anyone supporting them so uh, in in the area of of derazor uh, hajin this area if uh, uh, the coalition uh, USA now they are the US now they are the supporting SDF if they will give them more support uh, uh, because if you go there like Hajin it's very small uh, town and I was I was there in in 2019 in the time of liberation uh, they destroyed like uh, uh, they were bombing every single uh, uh, area so in in one in one street maybe 500 uh, meters or maybe one kilometer there's more than three rockets or four four five rockets in 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 the this street so they destroyed everything the hospital destroyed uh, all the 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 tunnel like water tunnels it's destroyed so if you didn't give them any support if there's no support of these people uh, they will go with anyone just coming and just like I, I don't know, I don't know. Maybe, uh, maybe the regime, maybe the uh, uh, Iranian militia, uh, because now uh, Iran uh, pushing a lot of money to this area, uh, training uh, 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 young uh, people from Beadin, Bokama, this area, giving them money, uh, salaries. Uh, so they will just they will just go with uh, anyone who's uh, supporting them, and uh, uh, the same the same was uh, was SDF. So uh, I don't know. In 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 these times, it's really uh, now with like, all the people busy with uh, with COVID nineteen, and uh, there's no support to the area. The no NGOs. Uh, I think uh, ISIS will come back again. Uh, will they will have this their support again in the area? Uh, again, they will not be like before, but of course, uh, they will have some support of of the area. So more so more more services will solve this problem in the in the area thank you Cameron. uh paula what do you think um i was gonna make two comments uh, first what what Cameron is is saying um yeah i completely agree um and i also yeah i think that in iraq like in line with what I said before, right? Like, if the government is not supporting the population and the, um, not protecting adequately the population, you cannot expect the population to 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 fight potentially well equipped in the future, potentially well equipped insurgents on their own. Uh, they might let them pass. They might not maybe join them or like sympathize, but 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 um, but they they don't want to be harmed by them. And at the same time, like maybe to a certain extent, they end up providing protection and and, uh, and services. And and for example, when, when I took over in 2014, I, I think that's that's why initially they were so successful, no? Because they were providing like protection and and and, uh, and justice and their own vision of rule of law and state governance. Okay, uh, which we might not perceive as justice, but it, it was a system, a less corrupt system. Um, so, so I, I think, um, if the, as for Iraq in 2020, if I would say like, if the government, and then with the support of the international community and the coalition forces, if the government don't take the necessary steps to, to improve the coordination, the means the, the coordination between security forces, intelligence, say, the training of the security forces, the diminishing of the fragmentation of the security forces. If they don't work in the security file as well as in the reconstruction file, and then ultimately on the like kind of like social cohesion, reconciliation, uh, I I think it's gonna continue to 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 deteriorate. And I would like to ask actually Cameron, what, what do you think about this in Iraq? About kind of like the likelihood of like how 2021, yeah. Yeah, I think it's yeah exactly. It's uh, as, as you said because uh, in 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 uh, in Syria when Jamhat al-Nusra came because they 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 call themselves al Nusra to 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 support people of the area. So to Nusra to Yansur to to sub, like to help people of Raqqa in this area like Derazur and 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 uh, uh, and Raqqa from the regime. So when they came. 
they came under this name to support or to help uh, 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 people, the Sunni, uh, like uh, Raqqa and Deir Azor, uh, against the regime. So th that's why all the people just go with them. And now anyone will come and will, they will say, oh, they, we are just coming to support you uh, against uh, SDF. But if there is a, a support from the uh, uh, from coalition uh, and give them services, because you cannot you cannot tell anyone just go away from ISIS because they are dangerous because they're ideologists like this. If you didn't give them any alternative, in 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 Mosul it's the same thing now. You can just go there, and still uh, I was I was there last month in in Mosul still uh, buddies under under the, the rebels in in Mosul. So how you can just tell them guys just go uh, ISIS is dangerous and stay away. So you should like the the the. the Maybe in Iraq, because they have, like, at least they have, like, a government. They can do something for, uh, for, uh, for Mosul or for Anbar, this area. But in, in Syria, it's, it's two, two types, like the regime area, no one supporting them except Russian with the Iran, and uh, they are not, they are not, uh, uh, they, 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 people not accepting them in the area. Then on the other side, there is uh, the Kurds with the coalition, uh, uh, there is a big number of of, um, of Arab. Uh, they are not with them because they are Kurd, or because they're Sheikh on the other side. They are with the regime, or because they are with with the opposition on in Idlib or in Turkey. So, uh, without any services, without any uh, 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 money to push money in in that area, helping people, uh, we cannot find any solution. Thank you very much, uh, ladies and gentlemen. Uh, our uh, our time is coming to an end. Uh, uh, Paula Cameron, uh, do you want to have uh, any final uh, remark or statement or comment? If not, uh, if not, thank you very much for participating and de delivering outstanding analysis. Uh, of uh, what ISIS is, so to say, up to now and what we should expect and why the situation is perhaps not as good as, uh, as we may think after the military defeat of ISIS uh, in those areas. Uh, I would also like to thank uh, audience for, uh, for uh, your questions, uh, for staying with us and for being interested in the topic. And ladies and gentlemen, I hope we are going to see each other uh, sometime in the future in one of the uh, webinars of the Prague Center for Middle East Relations. Of course, I would much more prefer if it were not a webinar. Uh, I would much prefer if it would be in person. But face, face to face, yeah. <laughs> uh, but let's see. Let's see what COVID. Uh, let's see what COVID uh, uh, brings uh, brings uh, in this year. So thank you very much. Ladies and gentlemen, and uh, and goodbye. Bye. Thanks so much. Bye. Nice evening. Bye bye. Thank you.